Welcome to our Book Reporter Talks to interview where our guest today is Christina Baker Klein, who many of you know. I'm going to say this and you're going to say, oh, I know that book. The best-selling book, Orphan Train, which has sold more than 3.5 million copies in print. So, I mean, seriously, what a great accomplishment, as well as her historical novel that I found in my house, A Piece of the World. But today, we're going to be talking about her latest novel, The Exiles. By the way, we just have to still pause for a second. How great do these two covers look with each other? Aren't they amazing? Like, what a nice packaging, both of them. So I am so pleased to have her here. This is another Book Reporter Bets on selection, and it's about a topic that I have knew nothing about. And I am so pleased to have her here so we can chat about it. So welcome, Christina. I'm so happy to be here. So let's start by you telling us a little bit about The Exiles. I would love to. So The Exiles is the story um, of the convict women who transformed Australia and in the mid-19th century and the Aboriginal people whose way of life was destroyed when colonists landed on their shores. Uh, and so my story begins in 1840 in England, and it ends up in Australia, which is where um, the sort of um, body of the, of the book takes place. The Exiles centers around three women in 18th century Australia. One is an English convict, Evangeline. Second one is from Scotland, Hazel. And then there's an orphaned Aboriginal girl named Mathena. Were these always the three characters? Did you always know it was going to be three? And these were the people you had in mind? When I conceived of the book, I, I had in my head a sort of the idea of passing a baton, that one character would begin the journey um, and would hand it to another. And then Mathena's character, um, Mathena, who is already in Australia when the other convict women arrive, is woven in to their story later. But um, I, I had this idea of these characters who shared some ideology, like, for example, um, the central character, Evangeline, who begins the book, passes on this concept of a, the rings of a tree that are mm -hmm. the people in your life who keep you strong. She passes it to Hazel who's the Scottish girl, midwife, who's 16. And then Hazel passes that on to Mathena. And so I, and, and Mathena has her own um, philosophy that she shares also. So I had this idea that they would be sort of fluidly moving in and out of each other's lives. The rings of the tree. And I had all those pages folded down when I was reading over the weekend, because the first time I read it, it was beautiful, the way it came together. And then as it, I kept reading and I saw it come up the other different ways, it was just this beautiful metaphor that was coming through in the story. And I think it begins like, you know, as you peel the layers back on the tree and it's telling the story of your life as the rings build up. And it was just so wonderfully done because it was, at the first time I just read it, I was like, wow, that's great. But then when I saw how it worked for each of them, just beautiful writing, really just so well done. Thank you. I was trying to think of um, a metaphor. It came to me when I was, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a log in the fire and it, I started thinking about how the rings of a tree build to keep, mm -hmm. to sort of strengthen the trunk. And I was thinking about that in terms of relationships and how we carry the rings of the people who've influenced with us. And um, because, you know, for these women in my novel, um, loss is the only constant. They, they're coming from their homeland, these convict women and the Aboriginal girl. They're both, they're all rested out of their, the places that are familiar to them and the people they know and love are, are gone. And they have to make it on their own resources and they don't, and their own wits and they don't have, anybody helping them. So the only thing they have it, the ability to do really is to forge friendships and relationships with people that are a, for a kind of family. And they're young. They're not young. They're, they're not um, like they have all this experience and all this kind of life experience. Each of them is at a very pivotal time in their lives where their lives are still being shaped, but yet they're moving in and out of each other's lives and they have to grow up very, very quickly. That's the one thing I was seeing with them is there wasn't childhood here. There was immediate adulthood, no matter how old you were, because you had to be responsible for yourself. And I thought that was a very big theme as well, is 
how am I responsible? How am I going to take care of myself to survive? These convict women in real life were so young, mm -hmm. partly because the whole concept of the convict system sending women to Australia was that they were um, they were sent as breeders. The British government wanted to populate Australia, and by 1803, they had been sending male convicts over with only a few females, and um, Australia was nine to one, men to women. Wow. So they looked around and realized they needed to solve this problem. So they started sweeping women off the streets of England, Ireland, and Wales, and Scotland, and uh, sending them over on the flimsiest of pretenses to populate Australia. And in fact, that is what happened. And that's where the whole, the whole comp continent was built from, was originally exactly. on the backs of the convicts, on the backs of the convicts. Yeah. Now, there were many sparks for writing this. Your author's note at the back is one of the best I've read. And I felt like that was a book unto itself of what you had done. But you were first in Australia in your mid-20s. And when you were there, what was it like even at that time? Was it as... Was it as developed as it was? It was it like the states at this point? What was it like at that time? Australia is such an interesting country because it's young, mm -hmm. uh, younger than America even, and um, it's it's like the states in a lot of ways. There's that kind of pioneer spirit that America has. Um, it, but in some ways it's looser and freer. Mm -hmm. I think some of that is about the convict heritage actually, that they, um, they came over, a lot of them were rebels and renegades um, who weren't exactly rule followers. Um, how do you end up in prison, you know, in Australia? But uh, it, it, it was a really wonderful, fun place to visit. But I must say that in Australia, as is true in America too, until recently, um, there's been a lot of ambivalence about talking about their complicated past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like America, there are so many parallels. Like America, they have this indigenous population um, that was mistreated and shunted aside. And in the case of Australia, in some ways I see the uh, Australian aboriginals, if we want to think about their experience, it's a little bit like a combination of what happened to the Native Americans here and the African Americans here. Mm -hmm. The Aboriginal people in Australia were um, absolutely deprived of their lands, they had no rights, and they were discriminated against as black-skinned people. Um, and that still goes on today. But there's a lot also being done about it today. And in fact, the Black Lives Matter in the United States has definitely had ripple effects over there. So when I went over to Australia as a grad student, right. that hadn't yet happened and people weren't really talking about this stuff. And my original impetus for having an interest in Australia was reading this incredible book called The Fatal Shore by Robert Hughes. And the book is 68, 688 pages, but only one chapter is devoted to the topic that interested me most, which is convict women and uh, the Aboriginal people. So I read that book and I thought, I just want to know more about this, these mm -hmm. stories. And so that was sort of how it all began. That was the germ. And so when you went back to Australia to do research for this book, you did go back. Was it different from when you had been there two decades ago? Like how much has it changed? It was very different. And there were some actual, actual markers for me that showed how different. So for example, the women's prison that I write about in the novel called The Cascades, which is in Tasmania, um, had been opened three years before I got there as a museum. So it ha it's, and it's now expanding actually, and is very, um, it's a historic trust property, et cetera. But it had been neglected and abandoned until only three years before I came for the first time to do research. And the museum in Tasmania that has a very, large section devoted to Tasmanian Aboriginal people and the history of their um, of the country in that way um, had opened three months earlier. So mm -hmm. all of that is new. And there are a lot of new historic sites in Australia and places that people are um, beginning to sort of think about these issues in an academic way and in a structured way. Uh, there's a truth and reconciliation, you know, sort of movement in Australia as there is here. So think change is coming, it's yeah, slow. Very, very interesting. So how many times have you been there? You were there two, three more times? 
I've been there three times. And three times. most recently, it was about a year and a half ago, as I had already um, uh, written some of the novel. And it was great to go back two years apart to go, you know, the first time I went, I was just gathering information and interviewing people and going to all these places. And then the second time I had or had already begun writing. And so I was really able to focus on my characters and imagining them in these yeah. different real places. So in that details. was great. I have to say, Australia and New Zealand are two places I really would like to go, though I don't know. I can't picture, usually I want to bail on the plane over Denver if I'm on my way to LA. So yeah. I think the flight would be the part that does me. And my sister went for the Olympics years ago and she's like, this plane ride is so long. She's just like, and we, should, we got off in LA and we got back on the plane for like another day, you know, so... Well, I think this here, I have a tip for you. The secret is stop in Hawaii and have a little vacation for a few days because Hawaii is, I think it's 11 hours, right? From here. Yes. From you, from New York. And then you just get a little R&R and then it's not a real jet lag. The time difference is not bad at all. So that's the way to do it. I've done that twice and it was perfect. There's the tip. Okay, I get yeah. Kauai, which I also want to go to, okay, now my life is now under control. This is really- There you really- go. So writing these three very different characters, was there one that was easier to write than the others? Was there one that just came to you smoothly and said, oh, completely developed, or was everybody a challenge? Gosh, they were all challenges in different ways. I would say Evangeline, for me, was sort of a stand-in for the reader because she's she reads books. She's a book reader, and she grew up- uh, reading all the time and she lived in England and her father was a vicar. Um, The reason I began the book with her is that she is a fish out of water. Essentially, she's thrust into this situation that she's never imagined. And she's so affronted by it. She sort of can't believe that people are, in fact, there's a line I have that um, she says, now she knew what it was like to feel contemptible. Mm -hmm. And that's a new experience for her. So, in a way that was easy, having lived in England, I was, you know, I have dual citizenship and I lived in England when I was young and then again as an adult. And I recognized very clearly where she lived and all of that. But in a way, the most fun character was Hazel because she's a scrappy, mm-hmm. hostile when you meet her, difficult, uh, complicated 16 year old who's been um, mistreated. Uh, let's just say her mother sent her out to steal and she got nabbed and, and put away and she's just angry. And, but what's wonderful about Hazel is that she has lots of chutzpah and she also has real skills. She's a midwife. Her mother was a midwife. She's learned how to do that. And she's an herbalist and she knows how to treat um, illnesses. And so she becomes very valuable on the ship to Australia and she's able to barter her skills for lots of things and it helps her all the way along that skill. I wanted to give her, I wanted to give that character a superpower Mm -hmm. and that's what it felt like. You know, she was, she's sort of a superhero for the book in that she's in these terrible situations and conditions and she's sort of able to get her, rest herself out of them. She's brighter than the doctors on many times. She's also understanding the people. She has a very strong people skill, which a lot of other people are lacking in this book. And as a result, her um, feelings about things can come through because she actually understands people. She's looking beyond just the facade of what's going on. And I found hers to be so interesting. I also think that researching the parts about the herbal, you know, the tinctures and everything she was doing, that must've been fascinating because all those little things that you just don't think about. Let me go get this, this, this. And then she does something with one of them that was exactly what needed to be done. We won't share any more than that, but she has all those skills. Yeah, she, that was really fun was to talk to herbalists in Australia and also to, there are so many websites and blogs of, of often women who are sort of craft people who are weaving and, you know, sewing and, doing all kinds of home arts and rediscovering home arts. And part of that is growing things in the garden and learning how to, um, for good and ill, <laughs> learning how to make, learning how to use plants. Mm-hmm. That was super fun. I, you know, my parents were hippies and uh, I grew up in the, I was born in the sixties and grew up in the seventies. Um, and so my mom had a lot of friends who were kind of in that world too. So it was fun to go back to that kind of experience. 
Yeah, and you definitely felt her. You also do something in this book, and I'm not going to give anything away, but you do something very daring with one of your characters. I was speaking to an author the other day who had read the book, and she said, this is very daring what she did. And you do it that shifts the story. And it's not something I can recall being done before. It's not something that I can recall anybody doing, yet it mirrors life so well. And I'm not telling you any more readers. You're going to have to read the book to figure out what I'm talking about. Is that something that came to you as you were writing that you knew you were going to make that move? I actually knew that I wanted the story to shift radically. And I also knew from having read hundreds of accounts of convict women and um, stories from the time that things happen that are unexpected in real life. And Mm -hmm. that sometimes as novelists, we, um, we don't want to shock, so we avoid them. And I thought, I'm just going to go for it. This is, this, I want to show what this is really like. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, and I did. And I know it was shocking, but I also think it freed the story in a mm-hmm. lot of ways mm-hmm. and enabled it to expand. It expanded really quickly. I also can tell you exactly where I was sitting when I saw that, when it, when it happened. And I was like, whoa, whoa. And it's like, glad I wasn't skimming because I would have missed that. You know, it's really, really so well done. So, so well done. You know, um, most of the convicts were men. Only 25,000 were women. Were there specific crimes that women were sent over to Australia for? Like the woman who had stone with spoon, the other one was, you know, infidelity and stealing. Was stealing the thing you were sent for or was it just really anything? It was petty crimes. So, Interestingly, prostitution was not illegal. Mm-hmm. So while a number of women who, like Olive, who mm-hmm. were on these ships were ladies of the night, prostitutes, whatever, um, they were not arrested for that. Mm-hmm. Most of the women were there for stealing. And the truth is there were no social programs at all. There w- was no social safety net. These women were absolutely at the mercy of society. Um, There was no birth control, you know, all the things that protect people today. Um, And, and uh, so you're, uh, you're a young person in Glasgow. It is, you're, you're, if you're not at the top of the social ladder, you're Mm -hmm. just in trouble. Mm -hmm. And there was virtually no social mobility in England and Scotland at the time. So you were just stuck there was the Irish famine. There were all these terrible things happening. There was, you know, famine in Ireland. The Industrial Revolution was replacing jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, child labor was rampant, and so and and the court system was completely rigged for the rich. Mm-hmm. So if you were picked up off the streets, chances are y- you're going to serve time in a terrible prison in England or Scotland, or you're going to get sent to what they called the land beyond the seas, the land Australia. Beyond. Yeah. Well, and for Evangeline, even when she went to the part of London where the prison was, she'd never even been there. She's like, what are these streets? Like this was a, an alien place for her to have gone to in the city. And she starts seeing how other people are living and it was completely different for her. So she was really thrust not only into the prison scene, but like, wait, this is the way other people live. I had no idea because she was really a different class just because of her father and what she right. did. And she was a governess, so she was in this world of, um, of you know, sort of respectability. There's a scene in the novel when the women are being transported out of Newgate Prison and to the ship, uh, and they're put in this um, open, drafty stagecoach, and these two women come by, walk by in their silks and who are quite respectable. And Evangeline is just aware in that moment that of how far she's fallen and that she'll never, she will never be that. And, um, and that those people are horrified by her. And that's a very strange feeling. The disdain that they look at her with, this, well, the way that they, and that, I think that is as big an affront for her as being in that wagon as it is, because she realizes that no one is going to help her. I think at that moment, that's what I saw like in the writing is all of a sudden I am really by myself. And these women are not going to say, wait, she shouldn't be there. Let me go pluck her out. Because of where she was, that's who she was as a result as well. So that was my takeaway. Yeah, there's one really amazing woman who existed in real life, um, Elizabeth Fry, who was a Quaker reformer. And she was a wealthy woman who 
spent her, she sort of spent her life taking care of women at Newgate and the women on the boats going to Australia. She gave them respect. She showed them respect. She brought them books and dresses and materials to make quilts because they were bored and had nothing to do and also needed a skill. So she, she really helped. And I read a lot about her. She was quite amazing. Yeah, because reading the prison scenes, it, are they tough to write when you're writing something that's that sad? Is it tough to write? Like, do you get up and say, oh, wait, make a look at the sunshine for a while? It, it was especially, uh, I, I don't know if tough, but in researching it and learning how tough, hard it was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I wasn't sure that I had conveyed, I, I didn't even go as far as I could have. And mm -hmm. when so at the end of the book, I asked my editor if she thought, I had been too um, light on the details about the difficulties. And she said, uh, no, you no. did not. You were not. <laughs> Even I really was afraid I had like whitewashed the story too much, but, but no, I think people are, I, I mean, I'm getting all these responses like, oh my God. It's so awful. And I'm like, if you really knew, it's even worse than that, really. But, well, even um, the boards on Athena's room, the boards where the window is like covered. It's just like everybody was kept these certain ways. Even if you were living someplace, you weren't going to live like the others. Let's board up the room. Let's not let you have the... And I think that the lack of light was something that I saw a lot because there was a lot of a metaphor of it was dark and things were very, very dark at those moments. But it was also when her, she was boxed into that room, that's what you're feeling. When they were in the bowels of the ship, it was this light and darkness that I was seeing as well. So That's interesting. You know, I, I hadn't thought of those things in the same light that you just, um, that you just talked about them in, but you're right. That detail, again, you, so Mrs. Fry, you know, Elizabeth Fry was a real person and Mathena was a real person also. Mm -hmm. And that detail of her, when she arrives at the governor's mansion, she's been taken in by the governor and his wife on a whim, uh, sort of a, uh, to be a project, mm -hmm. um, to see if they could turn her into a lady. But when she shows up in her bedroom, they boarded up the windows because they, they, they've heard that Aboriginal people will long for their people if they can see the wilderness outside. It was such a crazy detail and it was real. It really happened. So I felt like I needed to include that. Yeah, when I got there. And also her pet, like the way that she just loves her pet and her and how that means so much to her. And it's like her, her kindling block is that she has this thing that's like a toy that would be to other children. It's something for her to nurture at a time when nobody's nurturing her. And I thought that was there's some kind of love for her that she was giving, even though not much was going towards her. Yeah. And Mathen is only eight years old when the story begins. So she's very much a young child mm -hmm. and she has nothing except this little albino possum. And by the way, American possums are different than Australian possums. Australian possums are actually really cute. <laughs> so <laughs> someone said, Ooh, a possum. That's not very um, but actually they're how big they're, are they are they tiny are they little they're like this big oh, okay okay yeah and and uh you know it slept in in real life the accounts are that she had this rush basket that i describe in the book and she had a kangaroo skin and the possum would sleep in there mm, yeah so cute. she loved it yeah well the details are the make it special you know it but also it's the details about things like collecting the animal bones, the children in the slums in London, collecting the animal bones that would be mixed with clay to make ceramics like the bone china in closets. Little detail. Didn't really think about what went into bone china. Um, Mathena's mother's necklaces, the way she made those necklaces, the craft of pulling that together. I want one of those necklaces. Am I like right to imagine that writing those things was fun? Like those little kind Very of- Very fun. All those details. I mean, that's part of the joy of writing a book set in the past is finding details like that. And that was true for me in doing A Piece of the World and Orphan Train as well. Um, these little moments that aren't even necessarily part of your story, the central story, but are part of the larger narrative and that give texture to the book. Mm -hmm. I loved finding all of those details. And it was, I had to be really ruthless to trim them so that I wasn't just saying, hey, listen to this cool thing and listen to that cool thing. Um, there are a lot in there, but I took a lot out as well. Just to I was going to ask of... you that. I was going to ask you, were there more? Because what's there is so good. But the way those were written, I was like, I bet there's more. And I bet there's more because it was just so well done. 
One of the pitfalls of writing, uh, so, sorry, but one of the pitfalls of writing about the past is that you can get enamored of all the details and that, and you've done all this research and it's almost like you want to show that you've done it. When for me, I, I write, I try to write quickly because I want to catch lightning in a bottle. I always say I want to capture lightning in a bottle, meaning the energy of the prose. But then I pair back really ruthlessly because I don't want it to feel like you're just reading some dutiful book report about all mm -hmm. this research I've done. I only want the details that are absolutely crucial in the story. Mm -hmm. And that Bone China one is a good example because even though it's not um, something that happens to one of the three characters, it's Evangeline looking out the window of the stagecoach and realizing that she's seeing in real life something that she, almost an apocryphal story to her mm -hmm. about how China is made. And here she is, she's lived in this house with China her whole life. And now she realizes, wow, the story, real story is quite ugly. Yeah, it's like what's behind the scenes is not pretty. There's nothing beautiful about it. It's nothing beautiful. Well, while the story and the plotting is what people are talking about, I really love the way you craft sentences as well. And I'm going to do, I'm going to um, talk about one describing Evangeline's feelings about Cecil, the young master of the house who uh, seduces her and impregnates her. It wasn't until much later that she realized that she had built gossamer connections between his words, still sticky as spider silk, filling in the phrases she wanted to hear. And that is just, just going back, I folded that page down and going back and looking at those lines, it's exactly what she was doing, but you could have said it so many different ways, but the beauty of the words, the way they came together on that page, I think made it even more special. And you could tell that that was something that you crafted. You didn't just write. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of that. I, it's, this book um, is definitely um, uh, an adventure story. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had a novel there. We have just the pre publication reviews cause it's not out yet, mm -hmm. but, um, two of those out of five or six reviews have called it monumental. I've never had a novel called monumental. monumental. I think, monumental. I think it's just because it's so epic, meaning you start in England, you're on this ship, you end up in this completely foreign place. Um, so there is that aspect of it that I, it goes along at a clip and it, uh, you know, takes place over time, et cetera. But, um, but really what I was most concerned with was the sentences and, um, it's not a poetic novel, but I did really want people to feel that they were having a, not only an adventure story, but a reading experience that was worth dwelling in. I hope mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, thank you for reading that sentence. Cause I, that's what I I'm trying to do. That's yeah, what I'm it, to it do. completely worked. And it, it, I was really thinking about the rings and the way you talked about this. And I'll just do the line that Hazel says about that. Sometimes imagine I'm like a tree with all the rings inside. And every ring is a moment that mattered to me or someone I loved. And all of them are right here. And it's just a beautiful line that's translated, as you said, through the characters. But it made you really think not only the tree, but also the way we are shaped as time goes on. And it's not just the people we know now. It's not just the people we knew then. It's all the whole experience of what happened along the way. And another time, Athena speaks about the where she lived now she sees as a speck of the world. Um, before she you knew the place was so huge. She thought home was so huge. And it was merely a rock in the ocean, too slight and insignificant to have a name. And I think that's a really great metaphor about what we see about our lives. Um, the R's are the center of something bigger. And it takes a moment to pull back and say, wait, there is all this other stuff going on. It's not just me. And I think you do that so beautifully with the characters because they're each living their own little silos. And then it becomes part of something else. Yeah, that was a really fun thing about having three characters. So the book is written in the third person past tense. And so I was able to go from one person to the next and inhabit them. Even though I wasn't writing in the first person, I sort of inhabited their way of thinking and speaking. And, um, and so you have these different perspectives on the world and all of them are at the center of their own world. But of course the other people are characters in each of yeah. their lives. So that's a, that, sense of perspective was really fun to play with. And it, and it, because each of them changes so much as the book goes on, become stronger, um, change their perspective, change like, you know, empathy. They come out with empathy in different ways. Um, you also read extensively for research. Do you write as you research or do you do the research later on? I know you, you said you went to Australia and then went back later, but beyond that, you had an extensive reading list of what you did. Was that up front or during? 
It was, so I did a lot of work up front um, and I, I kind of hammered out a 50 page single spaced document of the history. I knew that it wasn't exactly my story, but it was the, it was what it was, what, it, you know, what I knew about England and then all this research I did there and then on the convict ships and then in Australia so that I had a strong sense of what it really was like from 1840 to 1850, roughly. And then as I wrote, I, I still researched because you, you have to, you, you know, you realize you don't know what the kind of bustle women wore on their mm -hmm. skirts or uh, the, the, what the silverware looked like in 1840, you know, things like that. So you're doing a lot of research as you go. Um, some of it I would, when I was really writing, I would come, I would sort of make a note to come back and fill in. Mm -hmm. And some of it I would do as I went, stop, you know, take some time. But I have all these different files also. I was talking with someone yesterday about like, they said they use Evernote. I don't use Evernote or anything. I only use Word documents, but I had a file, for example, of flora and fauna and animals. And um, because when I was in Australia, I took note, I, I was sort of doing some of the things like describing the orange lichen on the rocks and seeing things and writing them down at the time. And that was so helpful to be able to go back to my notes and see what I'd written about Aus Australia while I was there. And then um, describing the plants and the, and the flowers and the all, I, like I wouldn't have known unless I had been in Tasmania that wallabies gather on the hillsides at dusk in the hundreds mm -hmm. and just stand there at a certain time of day, right at the end of the day. And, it, and they're just outside the city limits and it's, amazing these tiny little like kangaroo like creatures um so there were a lot of details like that that i i um the second time that i went back to australia i then had another bank of knowledge to sort of work with as i was revising and working on how, the book how long was each trip when you went the second and third times the second time because when you were in um graduate school that's something different but the the two uh trips while you were working on the book yeah, so the first time was six weeks in, a, in grad school, and then they were three weeks for each of the three additional times. times. And good. a lot of that time was spent in Tasmania because Tasmania is where my novel takes place. Mm -hmm. um, half of the women who were transported from England to Australia ended up in Tasmania. That was interesting to me, too, because I was... I hadn't thought about that. I was pulling out maps. I was doing all kinds of things while yeah. I was reading the book. I was like, wait, this is super interesting. The other thing that you've been influenced is by the female prisoners. I know you worked with a prison in New Jersey doing a writing project. And I did that, how did that shape your understanding of the prison system, what people felt or whatever? Did that come through as well? Because I feel like it did. Yeah, I mean, teaching in this women's prison in New Jersey was a pivotal moment in my life, and I didn't even know it at the time. I, you know, the interesting thing I think about being a writer is that you don't know how your own life experience will feed your work. And at the time, it seemed like an entirely impractical thing to do. I had three children who were all underfoot. I was teaching. Um, I was trying to write a novel and my and I was then spending an entire day because it was more than an hour. It was in Clinton, uh, the, New Jersey, and more than an hour from my home. And I was teaching in Supermax, which meant, first of all, I had to get approved. Um, it, took, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, fingerprinted and the whole thing to be able to do it. I wrote, an, I wrote nobody had ever done it, so I wrote a proposal to do this. Finally got approved, went, jumped through all these hoops. And then even just getting into the prison, I had to go through four levels of security because I was teaching the women who really were not leaving. They were mm. sent sentenced 20 years to life. There were lifers and there were, I think the, the shortest sentence in that group was 20 years. And so armed guards were outside my classroom. It was like Silence of the Lambs, a glass room. It was crazy. So the whole thing was insane. But the women were so interesting, of course, and many of them had never written about their own lives before um, and had never actually processed them in the way that they did in this workshop. And it became a very interesting experience. And I learned so much. And it made me think long and hard about both the foster care system, which I'm also quite involved in. And uh, I work with a, an organization called Roots and Wings that I really like in New Jersey that works with foster kids 15 to 25 years old, mm -hmm. right in that in-between age. Mm -hmm. It's hard when yeah. they haven't been placed and they don't have support 
and they so they don't know how to apply to college and all those other things. Um, and the truth is that most female prisoners at that facility had been in foster care, at least half. Mm -hmm. It was it was very wow. interesting, wow. and um, a lot of foster kids, a, a surprising percentage, end up in the prison system in, in one way or another. So I wasn't, obviously in the 1840s, there wasn't such a thing as foster care, but essentially these were those kinds of kids who had been neglected and abandoned, a lot of those female convicts. But on the positive side, I wanna say one thing that I took away from my experience teaching in this prison is that even though a lot of them were there for a long time and even had, as I said, had life sentences, they found moments of joy and expressed that and they formed friendships and they um they did things like i remember one whole conversation that was really interesting about how they had this commissary and they had a random ingredients like cheez it's and ramen noodles and soy sauce packets and things and they would create these recipes and share them with each other and it was this inventive way of taking okay. what you what you're <laughs> yeah. given and making something of it and it was it provided endless amounts of entertainment for them and they you know they every month or so they would get some different ingredient in the commissary it was almost like that cooking show where you're putting things together and trying and to make a meal it's gonna be like lime jello right? yeah <laughs> exactly like, that's yeah. exactly right and and so you would just come up with all these crazy things to do with it um so my point is that that informed the way i wrote about the prison in mm -hmm. tasmania because i wanted to show that the women were industrious and mm -hmm. also um even though it was relentless in some ways they also found ways to subvert the system and to make their lives fun in some ways and that was important even on the ship, it's like, okay, who did this? Who did that to make their lives better? And it's, yeah. it just shows them wherever people are, there's, there's some people who have that knack and that talent just to make their lives different, better. And they were very creative at the same time as you would think that, oh, these are just, you know, prisoners. Out of, no, it was like, they were like these very, very, their lives were just as full as everybody else's lives were. It was just very different kind of fullness. That's what I to was To me, saying. that's exactly what I learned in teaching in the prison, that their lives are as full and mm -hmm. that you can lead a rich and full life mm -hmm. in that world. And I hadn't quite realized that. Mm -mm. I hadn't you think it's here, that. but all of a sudden yeah. it's here, but it's this way. It's, I, I just- You build a society, you exist, you know, in the world that you exist in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the way that children, um, when you're a child, you don't necessarily know that your family is strange, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, yeah. It's the only family you have. So you think that's what a family is. Um, you know, as an adult, you're like, oh, why did my parents do the, that thing? Oh. Or, but, um, you know, but you don't know. That. <laughs> yeah, they didn't, exactly. all that. they didn't all do that. No, no. Yeah, it, I just read a fantastic book called um, All My Puny Sorrows um, by Miriam Tours, T O E W S. And um, she herself actually grew up in a, a a sect, a religious sect. And she writes so beautifully about this concept of um, that you grow up the way you grow up and you don't realize that it's so different from everyone else or from the mainstream society. And so I, I loved playing with that in the exiles as well. Well, you know, so many times when people go away to college, they realize, let's say you go to an Ivy League school or you go to a good school or whatever, everyone else did the same thing. Like everybody else has done the same world. There was a very interesting article in the Times right after the uh, pandemic broke out. And there were all, there was three students at Dickinson College. And one went to her home in Maine, the sec her family's second home in Maine. The other one went to Miami to work on her family's food truck. And the other I one was that. from Russia and she couldn't go back. And what you realize is everyone's the same, but they're not the same. And even in prison, everybody's the same, but they're not the same because it's where they came from, what had ended up happening. It's all those, the layers, the, the, the tree layers that have the, you know, the rings of the tree that have gone through your lives and whatever. And I just found it was so interesting just reading a piece like that. And I'm looking for more pieces like that that just sit there and say what the human experience is like, because we all think it's everybody's the same and it's not, it's not much yeah, the same at all. Very, very different. Yeah, exactly. I think that with COVID we're seeing that exposed mm -hmm. in a way because people do not have the same opportunities. They don't mm -hmm. have internet, they don't have laptops and schools are mm -hmm. expecting all of this to work. And it's really, it's really exposing a divide. 
mm -hmm. in the country. Well, you're also thinking that, like, how many people have bought their seven-year-old a laptop? I mean, even if you were well off, how many, lap how many of them had laptops? Now, all of a sudden, you've got to go to school. And it says, your mom go to the meeting or do you have your laptop? It was very, very interesting moments. Um, Absolutely. The Exile seems like it was the expected title for this book. It was the expected title. Was this always the title or did it change? It did change. Um, I love the title, actually, and I really like the cover as well. I think it captures the spirit of the book, of the novel. Um, <clears throat> for a while, there was a working title, Tin Ticket, because of the tin tickets the women wore around their necks mm -hmm. and um, Elizabeth Fry. And I liked the metaphor of that, the concept of Elizabeth Fry gave these women necklaces to wear that were stamped with a number and they were made out of tin and it was to protect them from being um she thought lost to the system she said if you're not identified by us and we don't have you in a ledger then anything could happen to you but the women a lot of the women felt that they were yoked by wearing this that they were They're marked branded, branded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, when I was in Charleston, um, I, I was in the middle of writing the book and I was visiting uh, friends and they, there was a house tour, I believe. And on the mantelpiece was a tin ticket stamped with a number. And mm -hmm. I said, what in the world is that? I'm writing about this stuff. And uh, the person said that the slaves in Charleston had a peg by the door because it was a they were in the downtown, and when you left the house, you would put on your necklace with a tin, with a ticket. Mm -hmm. And the Charleston Museum apparently has a collection of them. I thought that was very interesting. I'd never heard of the concept before. Yeah, but, what, ha what happens yeah, with the but tin that's ticket what, in the book? What happens with the tin ticket in the book is something that's interesting as well. But I could see this is this is a bigger. It's a bigger title. The Exiles is a bigger title. Is that is that it? Like it, it more encompassing? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. The Exiles is much better as a title. I think it, and because they're all exiled, all of the women in the book are um, from the Aboriginal girl to the convict women. All of them have been taken out of their homes and exiled to somewhere completely foreign. And I loved that idea. And I realized, you know, when we, when I fa finally found this title, I, I, did a word search in the book and I'd use the word exiles, you know, over and Many over times. again. <laughs> yeah. So it seemed like the right way to end up. So the cover is perfect. And to me, I'm just read, read, read exactly why I love it. it. Evokes how the ship and its occupants were so far from life that they knew it. And the sky is so ominous, but it has bursts of light. And I really like that it had both things going. And I feel like it could have gone so many ways with life in Australia pictured instead. This captures the real spirit of the exile, the loneliness, the, we, you're really not going to be any place that's anywhere close to anyone else. Was this always the cover direction? No, I, this was a fantastic way to go. I was so happy that we ended up with it, but we saw there were like 25 covers. I mean, there were so many and it, you know, you just know when it's right. Mm -hmm. I felt that way with Orphan Train as well. I knew that that was the right cover for that book. I was thrilled with that book cover, you know, when we finally saw it. And that, the designer for Orphan Train pulled three different images together. There was a mirror, there was a, um, a, an outdoor scene, and there was a train door. And you kind of open the train door to get into the book. So I loved that. But here with the Exiles, yeah, it's that epic quality. And actually, the Australian sunset feels like that. Uh, that yellow, that really intense color and the blue. It's great. It's so great. Beautiful. Absolutely stunning. I also love about the cover, by the way, that it feels like a found artifact in that it's sort of scratched and old. Mm -hmm. It's got this, the, the designer, um, who's the head designer at HarperCollins, just scratched it up and made it um, kind of look beat up. Beat up. Yeah, it's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Um, it's been an option for television, for a series which sounds yeah. really exciting. When we get back to television, we get new shows, which I'm really excited about at some point. I know. So how's that been? Are you going to be working on the writing of it or how will you be involved? I would love to. I'm, um, I'm an executive producer, mm -hmm. which is great. It's the first, I'm very, um, I, I like that idea. And um, it's the first time I've had that official option, although I'm quite involved in two other film things that are happening. One is um, Orphan Train. There's a lot of movement. There's a new director and Helen Mirren has signed on. And nice. so it looks like that would be a feature, is a 
feature film. He's just finished a script and another script. There have been a number of directors, but I think this one will stick. And then um, Peace of the World as well. But this is the first time I have an official capacity. Yes. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's it's pretty much an all-female production company, and they did Wild and and Gone Girl and Big Little Lies, and they're Australian and American, so they're LA and Sydney based. And actually, I think there is filming going on now in Sydney, so there it could very well happen sooner than some American productions. Um, and um, I would love to be in the writer's room, but we'll see what happens. I don't know if it'll be virtual, probably virtual. Probably everything yeah. in our life are very work virtual lives. I have uh, an author friend who's an executive producer, and she said, I never realized they were actually gonna ask me questions. And I was really gonna have to be this involved. <laughs> like, wait a second, they're asking me questions about things that I never really thought about having to have to answer to. <laughs> so I thought it was really funny. She's like, I wanted this my whole life. What did I ask for? It came true, you know? At the same time, I know you're very busy promoting this book now. Are you working on something else? Have you started the kernels or something else? I have a um, phenomenal idea for my new book that I want to come back and talk to you about. Um, we're in the process of, um, of, of doing that uh, deal right now, um, but it's very exciting. I was um, going to go back to the present day and write a contemporary novel, but unfortunately or fortunately, this... Um, idea fell in my lap that I just can't say no to because it, it's a part of my own family history and it takes place in North Carolina at the time of the Civil War. Oh, so, that sounds fabulous. Oh, so I'm moving fabulous. around again, you know, a whole new explore. location. <laughs> at some point I'll have to go down and visit, but look, it's not five time zones away or you know, 25 time zones away, I'll be fine, I'll be great. It's true, I actually have relatives there, so that's great. <laughs> got places to stay, places to do. Well, I am so glad we got to do this. I absolutely love the book. And I was so anxious to talk to you because I want to share it with our readers. I know that book clubs are going to be wanting to talk to you about this book. They want to get in touch with you and do that through your website. Best way to do absolutely. it. Absolutely. I would love to talk to book clubs. Um, and I'm so honored that you asked me on. I love doing your show and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'd love to. <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> Well, then with that case, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, look forward to much, much success with the book. And to our uh, viewers and readers, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us.